so this project started out from that yeah. that hobby and uh the first steps for me was uh, probably writing uh, small lisp interpreters so uh, i started actually the first one was written in go and uh then I did one that uh, compiled to JavaScript and it had like built-in support for asynchronous, um, well, op asynchronous operations. So e every expression could be a promise in that language. So that was kind of the <coughs> twist in that language. Uh, but then I, I found found the static type system stuff to be to to be very interesting, and I started looking at type systems and how you could implement those and what kind of type sim systems there are. Which, through this Lisp interpreter thing, uh, led to uh, trying to do like a statically typed Lisp. Uh, and that began with uh, doing like a front end for Haskell that was a Lisp front end, just rewriting the syntax from, from Lisp to Haskell. Uh, not very useful, but uh, fun to try out. Uh, then I started looking at, because in that uh, front end, I had no idea what would actually compile down in the Haskell layer, layer later on. So I wanted to like move the type system up to my program instead, so I knew what would compile. Uh, so uh, there's this thing called Hindley-Milner type inference. It's an, an old algorithm f for for doing like a full type inference you have a a big expression with a lot, lot of lot of code and no type annotations anywhere and th this algorithm can go through this and um, like fully inf infer the type of each sub expression in the tree so i started looking at this hindley milner stuff and it's it's not very easily approachable it's quite hard to, to grasp, and I've mostly found uh, these uh, imperative uh, algorithms. Like The original paper, I think, was uh, with a, a, an algorithm that was an imperative implementation, and uh, I had a hard time to find like a functional uh, version of that, which I wanted. So, And uh, if I was going to do uh, this language, I wanted to build upon an existing ecosystem. I don't want to build like a standard library with networking and stuff and so on. I'm not that interested in those areas. So uh, that's like the, the background for Odin. Okay, but why? Why would I do th this language in, in the first place? Uh, and why would it be a language for for the Go ecosystem? So, the Go programming language, I'm not sure how many have heard about Go or know something about Go? Most of you, yeah? Uh, so, there's a lot of stuff in Go that I like. It's a, it's a very simple language. It's, uh, you know, you can basically learn it over a weekend and start to get productive really fast. And then the specification isn't that big. It's uh, it's a nice property. Um, it has built-in support for concurrency. You have these Go routines, like uh, lightweight threads, uh, baked into the language, and you can just spawn off stuff very easily. You have uh, channels built into the language as well as a, as a means to, to communicate communicate between uh, Go routines. Go has a, a garbage collector that's uh, quite nice nowadays. In the last two releases, I think they have improved it uh, very much. So uh, the, the kind of stop the world effect is down to a very minimum. And uh, Go doesn't have uh, like a crazy type system with uh, 300 uh, abstract classes, and you know, uh, it's very simple. Just you have structs and you have interfaces, and yeah, that's basically it. Uh, with Go, you can do static linking, which means you can compile into a single binary that doesn't depend on dynamic libraries. Uh, 
you can do cross compilation. So you can compile a program for Windows on your Mac and for Mac on your Windows, I guess, uh, as well, and lots of platforms. And I think that's a very powerful thing. Uh, so if you if you do like a, a, a small uh, library or uh, or tool or something, and you want to to uh, compile it for all the platforms and put it on a site so people can download it, it's very easy to do that. The Go compiler is very fast. Uh, yeah, it's basically millisecond, millisecond to to uh, to compile a small project. And I I heard some somewhere that the Go standard library compiles in about a second or something. So I think it's very fast, and that's also very nice because you can use the compiler as if you if you want to build like editor support for Go. You just invoke the compiler and see what it says. You don't have to start a, a process or a daemon process or something. That you can just invoke the compiler. It's that fast, so it, it works. And uh, the last point is it gets shit done. Basically, if you want to do something and you know uh, enough Go, you can just start writing your, your uh, solution. I think that's... You don't have to do like a 400 Maven XML file to get started. You know, it's uh, it's quite simple to to get a a good project up without a lot of hassle. And then there's the Go ecosystem. They have a, a great standard library with lots of stuff. You can write HTTP servers and so on just using the standard uh, library. It has an HTTP2 support nowadays, I think. Uh, there's a lot of tools for Go. There's this uh, format tool or FUMT, as they call it. Uh, they use it to, it's like convention to always run the Go FUMT tool on your source code when you save, save your file. So uh, uh, basically everyone has the same formatting. It's no, they don't have to argue about tabs or spaces or indentation. Yeah, kind of nice uh, convention thing, I, I think. And there's uh, coverage and linting, profiling. There's a race detector that helps you detect if you have a data races in concurrent code and so on. There's lots of libraries and uh, lots of projects uh, being done in Go as well. Some notable projects are Docker, Kubernetes, etcd, Fleet, and InfluxDB. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand and we'll take them as we go. There's a lot of info in, in these slides and in this presentation, so uh, just ask whenever you have something. Whoops. Uh, so what I'm missing from this uh, Go language, because uh, there has to be some reason to build another language on top of it. If I were perfectly fine with uh, with go i would just use it so there are some things i that kind of annoy me i would like to have expressions rather than statements in the language like if i want to to return a value based on some condition i can't write if uh, something uh, then this uh, else that i have to like uh, write an if statement and I have to use returns inside. And I like having expressions instead of statements, basically. And then there's uh, like the broader topic of abstractions missing in Go, I think. So the big thing is they don't have any support for generics uh, except from a couple of built-in types. So they have a built-in slice and array map types like collection types, that they are generic, but uh, you can't define uh, functions that are generic. You can't write a, a function that takes any type of value and returns uh, some other type of value uh, without resorting to using something called the empty interface, and that's like object or uh, like an untyped value. So you lose your typing, and then you have to cast it back and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So you can't uh, write generic functions or generic data structures. I can't 
implement my own sorted set or whatever for any data type. I have to, if I want a sorted set, I have to implement it for exactly the type that I need it for. And then I have to copy all that code and for int and all that code for float and so on. Yeah. So the question was macros. Uh, uh, Odin does not support any macros uh, right now. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'll talk a bit about macros later on. Yeah. Um, higher order functions is actually Go supports higher order functions in some sense, but without generics, they're not very useful. I can't write a generic reduce function, for example, or map and filter and so on. I have to write a reduce function that takes a function that operates on a specific type, and I have to write another reduce function for the next type, and so on. Uh, error handling is something in Go that's... I'm a bit torn about this, because it's both good and bad, I think. The uh, errors are conventional values in Go. There's no exception, uh, special exception type. There's no... Uh, like this function froze that, it just returns an error and you have to handle that value. And that's, I think that's a good thing. Um, Cause if you look at like Java, I've, I feel there's like two type systems in Java. You have the type system for values and you have the type system for exceptions and it kind of complex. So having um, errors as values, I think it's a good thing, but uh, it gets quite messy when you have to handle those uh, values because you don't have any good abstractions. And then there's nil checking. So uh, every reference type in Go can be nil and you have to handle that everywhere. And yeah, basically the same thing as in Java where everything is null. Uh, and the last point, better type inference. Uh, I don't think it's the most important thing, but why not? We can do better. Uh, so I'm going to show you some code written in Go. Here, I don't expect everyone to see the details, but this is some code I wrote, and uh, I'm not super proud of it. I'm using this as an example of where you might might end up with Go. So this function uh, retrieves a file from uh, the Dropbox API using uh, an access token, basically. Um, and there's a lot of steps. It has to construct uh, different types of clients and whatnot. And in between all those steps, there's a if error uh, is not nil, then return error. So there's no abstractions for handling this error. So you have to nil check errors everywhere. And all those steps can introduce a new error and you have to recheck, did that go wrong? Did that go wrong and so on. And then you do early exits on all those cases if there's an error. So what we would want is more like this, I guess. This is the the good stuff in here. Um, but when I made those slides and uh, made these uh, error handling stuff gray, I noticed something that's even worse from the code I wrote uh, back then, and that's this case doesn't do anything, it's useless, because there's no new error. Uh, this error is already checked before. And I think the fact that there's error handling everywhere made me kind of confused and uh, I didn't see that. So I, I'm like overly cautious and doing if error is not nil everywhere. So, so um, I think that's even worse. Anyway, this Go code is not uh, an example of the best Go code ever. I, I don't <laughs> suppose uh, I would get any awards for this, but I think it's like quite idiomatic anyway. It's about, uh, about how you uh, write Go code, I think. So uh, given these drawbacks and good stuff from Go, I decided to use Go as a platform instead. Uh, you can see this as like Scala or Clojure uh, on the JVM or there's this uh, LFE for Erlang or the Beam virtual machine. So I guess that's a trend. Uh, so let's try that. And uh, the goals with Odin is to first of all 
improve those drawbacks. Uh, we can't have that. Then this uh, type inference part. And uh, for you for you that don't, don't know what type inference is specifically, we can look at the Wikipedia uh, definition. Type inference refers to the automatic deduction of a data type of an expression in a programming language. So it's basically the compiler figuring out the types and you don't have to write them explicitly everywhere. Uh, another goal of Odin is to have immutability by default. And I haven't started working on this at all uh, yet. So it's, uh, it's a, just a goal for now. And immutable is something that's not mutable, uh, something that's unchangeable or changeless. And these are properties that's, uh, that are very good when you're doing concurrent stuff. You, uh, you don't have to worry about thread safety and so on. You don't have to surround everything in locks. So. Uh, it's simpler to, to think about uh, uh, immutable code and immutable data structures. I want to do some kind of pattern matching construct in Odin. And uh, I'm going to show you an example from a book called Learn You Some Erlang. So this is just a uh, simple function that it receives some value. It, we don't have to talk about the Erlang specifics much, but basically it gets a message uh, to this process and it pattern matches uh, on this value, having two values inside of it. It's a tuple thing. So uh, you get some, some process ID that you bind to the from identifier and you get uh, this atom thing, which is like the message content. And uh, then you send back stuff uh, based on the structure of the value you received. And uh, the last case, you just uh, write something out. So uh, this is a, a nice way, not doing like a if and checking a lot of stuff. And a, a, a feature I like to do that's related to this is something called exhaustiveness checking. And that, that means you have the compiler tell you if you've missed any of the, those cases in the pattern match. So if we translate the previous example to, uh, to Haskell, it would probably look like this. Kind of, it's not messages and stuff, but anyway. So we receive a message, we check, is it a do flip message? Then we return the string, uh, how about no? If it's a fish message, we return another string. But we have this, third uh, value that we forgot to, to match on here. So when we compile this, Haskell will get angry and say, hey, you didn't match the oh hi value. That's not good. So we have to add it and then Haskell is happy again. Uh, so that's exhaustiveness checking. So you, you're sure you didn't miss any cases. Uh, one major goal of Odenlang is to have a simple interoperability with Go. And that basically means not having to do uh, like the foreign function interface bindings and uh, uh, not having to do uh, strange uh, cumbersome steps just to being able to call down to Golang code. You're supposed to write some modern code, and if you want to use a Go library, you should be able to just do that without any strange hassle. And I want it to be fun. Uh, it should be fun to code in Odin, and I think it should be easy and fun for newcomers to, to start uh, trying, it, trying it out. It shouldn't be like reading free books or the full spec or something. And I want to have a, a good workflow, like the tooling should be simple and you don't have to write like a big make file just to compile stuff. It should just work out of the box and you can start uh, without knowing lots of stuff. And the, uh, I look at the, the Elm compiler, they have like these great error messages explaining exactly what went wrong and what you could do about it and where in your code 
that's probably uh, costing the error and so on. It's super, super nice error messages. So that's inspiring. I don't have those yet, but hope to get them. Um, so what's the what's the current state of Odin? I've been working on this project for a couple of months, uh, like October last year. I think I started the first. Uh, explorations. So this is where it's at right now. Uh, we'll start easy with the hello world, of course. Uh, yeah, nothing strange, I guess. So you see uh, we have a function called main and uh, its body is directly after the equal sign. You can write uh, data literals just just uh, as you'd expect. Uh, you might notice there are no floats in here or something like that. And that's because uh, I have this big thing in the type system that I want to get right before adding th those because uh, overloaded operators will get very much affected by that. So you can just use ints, booleans and strings and you have to be happy with that. So super simple, right? Uh, you have infix operators, just as, as in Go. These are basically the same, um, except the string concatenation. It's two, two plus signs instead. You write functions using uh, parentheses and the commas in between the, the, the arguments, uh, parameters, sorry, and uh, an arrow and then the body. So these are two anonymous functions taking the first one takes an X and the second one takes an X and a Y. Uh, we can assign those, give those names like this. And we can, at the top level of a Odin source file, you can use a shorthand that looks like this. So that's what we saw with the main before. You have just a name and the parents. Uh, when you're applying a function, it's the same old, same old thing. Nothing new here. There is something going on under the hood here that we're going to talk about. That's a little that you probably don't see from this, but we'll take it later. And there's this construct called blocks, and blocks are expressions as well. They have you can you can do multiple expressions and the the, the value of the block will be the value of the last expression. So you can use it to do like side effects and then return something. So you might like see an implicit return at the last uh, expression here. There's control flow with if, nothing uh, strange here. This is like the Haskell if, I guess. Uh, so it's not a statement, it's an expression. Uh, so this if evaluates to, to a value. So the, the thing that you can notice is, guess, I guess, the, the then part. You have to write then. Uh, you can use this together with uh, the block expression to get something that looks like a regular if from a more C-like language, but it's still an expression. So you don't have to write return one or return n times, so on. Um, yeah? Will this give you tail recursion? Or? Right, so tail recursion. Uh, there's no... Uh, Odin supports recursion, but it, it isn't aware of tail recursion, and it doesn't do any optimization based on tail recursion right now. But I have something that I'm thinking about doing later on, perhaps. Yeah? Do you have closures? Yeah. Closures is uh, basically they're supported by Go already, so it's just compiling functions down. Um, and functions in Odin are curried. So what this means is that functions actually only take one ar uh, parameter, and you apply them using one argument, and then they return another function. 
that has an argument and so on. So in this case, when we say plus of x and y, uh, it's actually a function from x to a function taking a y to some result. And that means you can apply it with just one value and you get a function back. So plus applied to 10 uh, is, pl uh, you get a function back, we call it plus 10. Yeah? Uh, is it possible to make a function with a variable amount, amount of arguments? Uh, no, variable amount of arguments is not supported. Because um, I actually had something for it. You, you couldn't uh, declare a function yourself that had it, but you could use, because Go has uh, variadic uh, functions, but um, I think it's, it doesn't fit very well with the type system, so I decided to not have it uh, right now. Um, there are some tricks. If you uh, look at Haskell, it doesn't have variadic functions as well. And they have like a trick for doing something that looks like variadic functions. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can look at the printf stuff in Haskell. It's quite a nifty way to get around it. So, um, <coughs> well, um, if we look at the type of a curved function, f the plus function we had before, it looks like this: it takes an int and an int and returns an int, basically. Uh, if you add uh, a grouping, just to be extra clear. It's actually a function that takes an int, returns another function, that's the part in the parens, that returns an int. So these are the same, but it's more clear if you write it like this, I guess. Uh, and given these two, uh, or, or given this, you can, you can also do curd, curried higher order functions, you can combine higher order functions with currying to, uh, to do like composition of generic functions. So this example is a bit trickier. We define the plus function as before. We define a twice function that takes another function and some value, applies that function on that value and on itself again. And then we say uh, we want a, a function called plus 20, just a third line. And it's the result of applying twice to applying plus to 10. So if you do plus 10 twice, you get plus 20, right? So that's the name. And then we apply plus 20 to the value 20, and we get 40 back. Odin supports something called slices. These are the same thing as in Go. And uh, uh, the Go documentation describes slices as like a view into a, a, a part of an array. So um, arrays in Go have a fixed length and they're typed by their length and their element type. And slices are typed only by their element type so they can have different lengths. You can take, you can receive a, a slice in a function with uh, any length, basically. So like an array list in Java or something like that. Uh, there's tuples in Odin, and uh, these are an, an ordered collection of a fixed number of values, and those values can have different types. So this person tuple here has a, a tuple of two elements. One is a string, one is an int. You can't... Uh, a, a, a a tuple of uh, two elements, string and int, isn't the same as a three element tuple of string int int, for example. They're distinct. So if we combine those two features, we can do stuff like this. We create two tuple values with the type string and int, uh, Jessica and Frank here, and we create a, a slice with tuple elements. We have type signatures in Odin as well. So you write a name at the top level and a, a colon and the type to, to explicitly annotate the type of that value. So here we say that n is an int and then we uh, give it a value as well. 
and in the next function here, f, we use the for all. That's a, a universal quantification. It's called a fancy name for. You can you can regard this as introducing a type variable that you can use in the type signature. So using this for all, we say, given that there is a type variable called a, the type of f is a to a. And uh, the type variables are like placeholders for actual types when, when this function is invoked. So if we call this function f with an integer, then a would re be replaced with int everywhere that it, where it says a. So this is the generic part. Odin supports uh, importing packages from Go. And uh, right now this is very limited because the type system isn't uh, doesn't support everything from Go. So there's a lot of trickiness. I mentioned earlier that one of the major goals is to be have interoperability with, with Go. You should be able to import stuff and use it. But then again, we want a better type system. So there has to be some kind of automatic conversion between the Go type system and the Odin type system. And that's the tricky part, finding a way to kind of translate in between. And it's back and forth, because you can use um, Go functions in Odin, and you can pass Odin functions to Go, and both has to work. So you can import packages. So here we import a simple HTML package where we use the escape string function. And this is just a string to a string, so it's simple. But uh, if it were like interface uh, and interfaces from Go, it wouldn't work. But you can use some stuff here. And uh, I think if this gets right, this is this is like the only way to to have this language be successful if this works, because if it if it doesn't work, then it's too much work uh, to to be able to use the Go stuff, I think. <coughs> and uh, on that note, uh, functions written in Go, we have an ex example here. We say you can imagine this first function being written in a Go file and imported. Uh, it gets automatically curried when used from Odin. So you can apply to just one argument to get another <coughs> function back and so on. So you can use them just as you would with Odin functions. Uh, another recent feature that's, uh, I think it's like a, a very good, good construct is the record feature. Uh, so here we uh, declare two record values these have the same type. They have the official, which is a string. There are three fields in each record here. So it's uh, official field has the string type, population has the int, and capital field has the string type. So you can look at these basically like structs uh, in Go, but perhaps also a bit like um, objects in JavaScript or or like a map. It's somewhere where it's you have a strongly typed map, basically. You know exactly what fields are in it, but it's not as uh, strict as a struct in, in Go or C. So the type of these two values are like this. You, you use the braces and you list the fields and their types. So that's fine. Uh, nothing super exciting there. But then there's the extensibility, extensibility part of these records. And uh, we're going to look at an example that's a bit bigger. And uh, it looks like this. We uh, declare Bonnie and Peter. And we uh, create this function called full name that takes some value and concatenates the first name and the last name of that value. and with a string in between. And then we just call the, uh, the full name function on those Bonnie and Peter values. So is there anything strange going on here that you can see? Something that's suspect? Peter's missing. Right. There's an extra field, yeah. 
Bunny has an age and Peter doesn't. So uh, then you can start to wonder what's the type of full name really? How is is uh, two records with di a different set of fields the same type? So they are not. Here we add type annotations to those, those two values and we see that Bunny here has a, a age that's yeah, she has the age field in in the type, and Peter doesn't. So they don't have the same type. They're not exactly the same type. But we have this full name function, and it could take both values. So what's the type? It looks like this. And there's some tricky syntax here. Um, but basically, what you need to know is we use the for all here again to introduce a uh, row variable called r. It's just an ar arbitrary name. We can s give it any name. And then we say we take a record that has first name and last name and some other fields bound to r. And they could be whatever. It could be no fields at all, an empty row, or they could be more fields like the h uh, field. Uh, and then we return a string. So this function is, you can say it's polymorphic in regards to what field the record has. And this is just the first step for this uh, extensible records feature. There's uh, more stuff coming here later on. Um, you can write this Nice UTF-8 stuff in Odin. Nothing uh, super useful, but it has to be there, right? If you want to be a modern, cool language, you have to include emojis and stuff. Uh, so, is Odin ready for production? I'd say no. There is no floats and yeah, you know. But you can try it nonetheless. There is a site, odinlang.org, with some documentation and stuff, and you can run some of the code samples on the site. Uh, and that's using this thing that's called the playground.odenlang.org. And here you can evaluate, uh, run basic programs in, uh, in your browser without installing Odin. So if you just want to try this out, you can go there and check it out. So uh, before the pizza, we're going to look at what's coming next. So there is tons of stuff. Uh, I can say, if you, ha if you don't have a lot of free time, don't write a programming language on your own. It takes forever. It's horrible. So, <laughs> so this is just scratching the surface, I guess. But I want to do more stuff with records, like record extension and interoperability with ghost structs. They should convert automatically in between. Uh, I'm, I've just started working on something called protocols, and they're like Haskell type classes, basically, but uh, they have some stuff to be able to automatically integrate with the Go interfaces. And the, the, the difference between uh, the type classes and protocols and uh, the Go interfaces is that protocols will have a static dis dispatch instead of dynamic dispatch, which interfaces have in Go. Um, yeah, there's type conversions and uh, overloaded operators and stuff. And these these things has to be there before you can do anything useful, basically, as it is right now. So there's a lot of stuff to be done. Um, and you should, of course, be able to import Odin packages from Odin. You can't do that right now. So you can only write a single file, and that's a program, and another file, and so on. Uh, I want to do better code generation. Uh, to do the Go code like pops out on the uh, other end. Uh, the pattern matching we talked about before, and then uh, like better validation and error messages. Because if Odin produces invalid Go code, you don't you don't get to know it until you compile the Go code, and that's confusing. So, and we're going to talk about Racket and Mini Canron to start with, and this was. Uh, the technology is used for the first iteration of the Odin compiler. So uh, Racket is a, a scheme, and yeah, scheme is a programming language. <laughs> so it's a, scheme is a Lisp, 
and uh, racket is like uh, used quite much in education and there's a lot of stuff beyond the small scope of scheme uh, that's also in in racket so it's quite powerful and then there's this mini canron thing which is basically like a sub language in scheme for doing uh, logic programming so you can consider it like a small prologue thing uh, i don't know very much about prologue so please don't <laughs> ask any questions about that uh, is that so? Okay, yeah, cool. So uh, I can learn then. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, this compiler, uh, I started digging into this Hindley Milner type inference that I talked about earlier. And uh, and then I saw some talks about Mini Canron. Uh, this guy called Daniel Friedman. He wrote a book with two, two other guys called The Recent Schemer. And this is like a follow-up on the little schemer and so on. There's a series of scheme books. And this Recent Schemer talks about mini Canron and doing logic programming inside scheme. So there were some examples of doing interpreters and also doing type inference stuff with mini Canron. And Basically, mini Canron and the prologue stuff, uh, I think as well, is about constraint solving. So you kind of collect constraints and and uh, and try to find an answer to to a query, basically. So I decided to try this using Racket. So Racket is the scheme, and mini Canron is like the sub language inside the scheme. So it's basically a library that you can use inside scheme. And the first step here was to do some kind of statically typed Lisp. Um, so we're going to look at Mini Canron, how it works. It's a super, super fast intro to Mini Canron. I uh, hope you will get something out of it because I have to kind of go fast here. Uh, there's a concept of relations, and these are functions in Scheme that returns goals. And a goal is something that c could either fail or succeed. There's a, a function called fresh, or it's a macro basically, but yeah, it is a construct that in introduces new unbound logic variables. And unbound logic variables you can use uh, together with the values or other variables to create uh, create these kind of uh, compose your goals, you might say. Uh, there's a, a run construct that's like the interface between regular scheme and mini Canron. So you use the run to to do a query and get an answer or multiple answers. So this th it's the bridge between the languages. And uh, there's a thing called condi. It uh, it does something called logical disjunction. It's basically a logical or. So you list a, a couple of uh, cases or clauses and you say uh, any one of those can succeed or fail and basically if one of these uh, clauses succeed the whole expression succeeds or the whole goal and then there's the equal equal and that's used to unify terms so unification means that uh, two terms has to be equal to for them to unify. If they're not equal, this goal will fail. So this might seem very abstract and strange to right now. So we're gonna look at some examples to, uh, to hopefully make it more clear what it does. We start with this uh, f first thing. Here we use the run to like get into Mini Canron and we have Q, which we call a uh, like it's an output query variable. So we get this for free when we do a run, we get this Q thing. And we we unify values with Q for our output. So the values unified with Q are the answers to, uh, to the query. So here we say that we, we unify Q with 10. And the answer we get back is a list with 10 inside. So we get one answer back. 
And actually you see the run one means give me one answer for this query. So this, we could say run a thousand here. We will still get this result because there's only one way to satisfy this, this goal or, or, or this query. Because uh, Q, uh, Q must be 10 for this to succeed. There's no other way. Uh, if you don't unify these uh, query variables or logic variables, they will be unbound. So with fresh, we introduce some things here and we unify those. So uh, Y will be free and X and Z will be the same. And uh, the Q, we just ignore it. And as Q is the output query variable, the result will be this strange underscore dot zero, which means it's unbound. So it's, it's just a way to, to represent an unbound value in the result set. So we can also unify logic variables with each other and that creates like a link between all of them. So in this case, if X is free and Q is X, then Q is free. Right? And this Condi thing I mentioned, it's uh, the disjunction. It says, it, it's basically used for uh, getting multiple answers. So here we say, we have this Q output variable, and we say Q could be one or Q could be two. And when we run this, with two answers, we get those two answers back. So we have, a, it's a choice thing, basically. Uh, and you see these, these two goals, uh, unifying Q with one and unifying Q with two, it, it's just enough that one of these succeeds and the whole thing will succeed. So if uh, one of those would fail, we would go just get one answer back. So it tries to retrieve as many answers as possible. And here we, we trigger this kind of failure by saying outside the condi, because here's the thing, uh, inside the run and inside the fresh, you get an implicit uh, conjunction instead of disjunction. And that, that means a logical and. So inside a, a conjunction, every everything must succeed for this thing to succeed. So here we say uh, Q is unified with two, and then we go into the condi and we say Q can either be one or it could be two. And as we have already said that Q is two, the first case of the condi uh, fails because that, that can't happen. So only the second one succeeds and Q is already bound to two, so we get two back. You can use scheme lists as well when unifying. So here we unify X with a list containing one, two, three. And we unify X once again with another list using another syntax for creating a list uh, with one, Q and three. And as X is already a list of one, two, three, and we unify it with one, Q, three, then uh, Mini Cameron will basically recursively match those uh, corresponding parts. So Q will be two in this case. And uh, some uh, scheme syntax here. There's a thing called quasi quotes. You can, uh, if you write a backtick before a list like this, you get a quoted form. It's just the data. It doesn't try to evaluate lists. So. Uh, if you don't know any scheme, I guess this might be uh, a little confusing, but basically scheme is, is lists and terms and, and stuff, very b basic language. And uh, uh, you evaluate lists as function calls. But if you use this backtick thing, um, you get the actual list data instead. And if you use this backtick, you can use a comma to get back into the evaluating uh, mode, so to speak. So here we say we have a list with the first value is one, and then we want to evaluate expression plus one, two, 
as the second element in that list, and then we have a literal four. So we get one free four back. So this is standard scheme for uh, creating data structures and kind of in between or inside those data structures, do a little evaluation and then go back to literal mode again. And this we can use together with Minicanon to get a bit more expressiveness. So here we say, like the uh, example before, we say x is one, two, three, the list. And then we say x is this um, quasi-quoted list where we uh, splice in this q. So we evaluate the q. And that means that q will get unified with two again, like in this example. So they're basically the same. OK, a lot of stuff. Uh, quick info on Amina Canron. There's a convention when you take some of these rules and put them in a function. Uh, that's called a relation. And they usually end with the letter O for some reason. So this is from, from the book I, I talked about earlier. They had like a, I think it was like a subscript O or something just to mark relations. So uh, some examples are console, symbol O, number O, and absento. So these kind of sound like uh, Harry Potter spells or something like that, uh, or Latin, I guess. Uh, but these are analogous to scheme, cons, scheme, symbol, question mark, and number, question mark, and so on. And when using those relations, you can create a function, standard scheme function. We call it paro. We receive, yeah? Uh, yeah sorry to interrupt. I no, have a question. Yeah. Yeah, right. Do you have one in Clojure as well? Or? Yeah, exactly. So Mini Canron is, I think it started out as a scheme project or the first implementation, but it has been ported to. Yeah, uh, well, what's the difference between like Core Logic and the Mini? I think Core Logic is basically a Mini Canron port okay. with some differences. Maybe a bit adapted for Clojure, but it's basically the same thing. So uh, in this uh, relation paro, we take uh, three values and we unify the first two values, the first and second, as a list with the output uh, variable. So this is kind of a convention. You, the last thing you pass in is the, one, the thing you want to unify with as the output. You can't return a value. You have to, un you have to unify with some, some other value that gets passed to you instead. So it doesn't return the result of unifying. It doesn't return the O. It has to return a goal that in the, um, the Minicanron runtime registers that these two has to unify, basically. So anyway, uh, we can call this paro thing with uh, X and Y and uh, this basically says that Q is a pair of X and Y. And if X is one and Y is two, then Q will be a list of one and two. So what uh, all this nonsense has to do with uh, type inferencing and stuff? You can use this to, to build type inferencers. Um, and this was, this was the thing I started off with. And, uh, yeah, to, to first to do some type inferencing, you have to have some kind of expression to infer the types of. And that's called an AST. And looking at Wikipedia again, uh, we have an abstract syntax tree, AST, and that's a tree representation of the abstract syntactic structure of the source code written in a programming language. So it's basically the data representing the source code. And uh, in this case, we have an AST that's regular Lisp data. So here we have a list with the first value is a symbol def, 
The second is a simple identity, and then there comes another list with the function and so on. So this is just data. And this property in itself is kind of famous in, in Lisp and Scheme, because code is data and da data is code and so on. So, uh, and another thing is when you're implementing a Lisp inside, a, <laughs> if you're writing a Lisp compiler in Scheme, it's quite handy because you can use the Lisp reader from the scheme you're in and just, yeah, read Lisp code. Super handy. So we just, just use uh, the Lisp data as it is, f as our AST. We don't have a, a more complex structure saying that uh, this is a list and so on. It's just a Lisp, Lisp list. Okay. So the input and output would be a function, infer, that takes some value and returns a type annotated value. So when we try this out here, we say if we infer one, we get back this type annotation. It's a list with a colon inside. So it's the value, colon, the type. We get back the one again, same thing as we passed in, uh, plus uh, the thing after. Colon, one, colon int, sorry. And if we infer a symbol, we, uh, we would like to have some kind of environment saying that the symbol is a string, but let's assume that's the case, and then we get back uh, the same symbol type annotated as a string. If we infer a function that takes an x and returns that x, in other words, the identity function, we get back uh, this crazy thing here that's the same function but with type annotations everywhere. So the parameter is annotated with this uh, logic variable, the, the body, is the x, is uh, type annotated, and the entire function is type annotated with the function type. And you might see here that uh, the type that's everywhere is the underscore dot zero thing again, and that's the unbound mini uh, variable. So as the, the identity function doesn't have, it's generic, it doesn't have a, a specific type it operates on. In this case, it's just a function from whatever to whatever. It's an unbound logic variable representing that, that it isn't bound to any specific type yet. Okay, so uh, in this compiler, I'm, I'm just gonna show some, uh, extract some small pieces of this stuff. Uh, I had a function called inferro, but I always thought of it as inferno, because that was more fun. So <laughs> inferno or inferro takes some expression, some environment, and the environment is basically a map from symbols to types, stuff that's already defined. And uh, and uh, this output variable t, and t is the typed expression. And then we do a con d, and here comes kind of the magic, the, or the simple magic, so to speak. So we have some expression, and we have a lot of ways to find out what an expression, what the type of an expression is. So we try all those ways. So first we try by saying we have this predicate uh, relation symbolo, this basically says that in this, oops. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's the half time uh, mark. Uh, in this case, we, we uh, used the predicate symbol to say uh, the expression has to be a symbol. And uh, then we do a lookup in the environment to get the type of that X. And then we annotate uh, basically create the annotated form, expression of type x, and we unify that with t, the out output variable. So this is one case. And if this fails, there are other cases. So it just tries the one that works. So another case that's a bit more tricky is function application. And it looks like this. So here we do first a fresh with a lot of stuff because we need a lot of logic variables to be able to to do this inference. But here we first 
uh, basically assert that the expression has this structure. It's a, it's a list of a function and some argument, right? That's how you do function application. You create a list, you have a function, and then you have an argument. And then we recursively call this infero again with those two values to get to infer the function and the argument because they could be whatever. And we uh, kind of extract the types. Here we use the quasi quotation thing I talked about earlier. We kind of extract from those infer types um, what kind of expressions they are and what types those expressions are. And then we construct the function application type annotation uh, expression last and unify that with T. So uh, I think this is quite expressive. You have to get used to the mini and stuff because uh, there might be uh, a little noise uh, otherwise if you don't know what to look for basically. But uh, it's kind of dense, I guess. It does a lot of stuff in just a, a few lines. So I think it's uh, quite cool anyway. Uh, and then there are some ignored uh, variables, not so nice, but anyway. So my experience with this uh, mini can run thing was, well, the error handling isn't very good, I think. Because if something, if all these cases fail in the inferro function, the result I get back in the end, the whole program is empty list. Uh, okay, there's no answers to this type. I don't know why. I don't. I don't. I can't. I can't like a print line debug inside here because it doesn't work that way. So you're kind of lost when you have to look at everything and understand everything at the same time and kind of ah, there's the problem. So it's uh, quite hard to work with. You can build stuff up, but it's hard to find the problem in a big program. Um, I think the type safety. This is more a, a scheme thing, I guess. But uh, I tried this type bracket thing. It's uh, uh, I don't, you want to maybe know this better, but it's optional typing or gradual typing. I don't know, gradual typing for for scheme, and it didn't work with the the libraries I used for for racket very well. So I had to give that up. Um, and well, the state of this mini can run library or, or project is kind of in flux because there are a lot of implementations of mini can run, especially for Scheme. You find uh, repositories on GitHub everywhere. Some says it's the canonical, but it doesn't work with that scheme and that library works with another scheme and it's a total mess. And the people I've found that does these things uh, frequently, they have their own version. like. On my drive, in that folder, I have a working mini camera, I guess. That's the... <laughs> so I was very confused with that, and uh, there's basically no documentation. If there's a readme, you could be happy. And uh, often, like, missing functions or broken functions, and, uh, yeah, not that healthy project, I think. But it, it's, uh, it's kind of researchy, so I'm not sure if it... That's why. And being like a, this Haskell enthusiast, uh, I miss monads. Because um, Minicanron is basically one monad. It's a, a constraint-solving monad, you can say. And uh, when, when we talk about error handling and uh, having state in a program and so on, this is other monads or other concerns that you might want to mix in but you can't do that in a nice way. Not that I've found with Minicanron. You can't do, you can't kind of mix in error handling and say, oh, here something went wrong, just go go way out and report that error back at the top. So if you want to do error handling uh, in Minicanron, you have to do it yourself and you have to unify the errors and check them everywhere and do lots of crazy stuff. And this link points to uh, a small Lisp interpreter that does this kind of error handling. If you want to look more at that. Um, and uh, then I had some itches with uh, with the racket scheme as well. Um, kind of slow and it crashed a lot in Emacs and I got tired. And uh, the program took like 400 millis milliseconds to start every time. So 
not super bad, but kind of annoying anyway. So uh, what does one do? You learn Haskell, right? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, no, but I, I already knew some Haskell, and I I figured out I I want to rewrite this compiler in Haskell instead. So uh, I started out with this uh, by reading this book, or it's a it's a work in progress. Basically, it's called Write You a Haskell. It's by uh, a guy named Stephen Deal. It's very good. Uh, there's like 10 chapters uh, right now doing, he talks about lambda calculus and interpreters and type inference and, and stuff. Um, and I took uh, the example code from one of his chapters and kind of rewrote it to, to what I needed and started out there. So that was the beginning. Um, and yeah. The next thing in Haskell I want to talk about is uh, modeling, uh, modeling data and uh, types and the structures you you need in your program. So I think this is a very good thing. I like being like very explicit about what kind of da data I uh, want a function to take and what it can return and so on. So Haskell makes this very easy and uh, very clear what you're what you're doing. So uh, I want to introduce another term just so we're on the same page. Uh, and it's intermediate representation, in short, IR, is the data structure or code used internally by a compiler or a virtual machine to represent source code. So it's kind of like the AST, but uh, for subsequent steps in the compiler, you might say. So when we model this, these uh, uh, intermediate representations, I like to be uh, to list all the valid cases explicitly. This can be represented, this can be represented, and so on. And be very explicit but about what cannot be represented in the, in the data as well. So for example, if you always have one value one or more values. Maybe you shouldn't use a list because that can be empty and then you have to handle a case that doesn't exist and you get strange stuff. So uh, using that and having distinct types uh, on each side of a big transformation I think is really good because you, you kind of, if you have distinct types in the data you're trans transfor transforming from and a distinct type which you're transforming into, you let let the compiler help you. You basically you can't forget to do something, or you can't mess up and do it wrong because there's only way, one way to do it basically. So there's of course possibility for bugs anyway, but you reduce the, that risk uh, quite a lot, I think. So uh, one of these representations in in Odin is this syntax. This is like the AST. So we have expressions. They can be symbols, applications, functions, blocks, and some other constructs. Um, but what I want you to look at here is the name binding list here. So we're saying a function. This is uh, the parameters of a function. So we're saying a function can have multiple parameters in the syntax. And in the next step, we have this untyped, as it's called. It, this is another representation. So we have a transformation from the syntax to this structure. But here, a function cannot have multiple parameters. It can only have one. So there has to be something going on in between here, right? So we look at the, those kind of transformations that's being done. And the one we saw uh, just now was this, it's like a manifestation of this uh, curried functions in Odin. So you can write a function that seems to take three arguments, but it kind of gets translated to a function of one argument, to a function of one argument, to a function of one argument, to some body. So 
the representations or data structures in the compiler has this uh, notion uh, baked into them. So when doing the transformation, you have to cover this case. And that's called the explode uh, thingy, <laughs> I guess. So uh, you might call this uh, desugaring in more uh, standard uh, terminology, but it's called explode anyway. Um, and it, in this case for the functions, it looks like this. It takes a syntax function. It's just fn here. Uh, that has one param and the rest of the params. This is a destructuring of a list to the first element and the rest of the elements. And then we create this untyped value instead. This is a transformation step. So we, we create the untyped value and then we go and explode the name binding. This is basically uh, doing some unwrapping, not super uh, important here. But then we take the rest of our arguments and create a new function and explode that in turn and use that as a body. So here we kind of unwrap functions into functions with only one parameter. And if we had, diff if we had the same structure here, we could easily mess up and not know about it, right? So having those two representations helps. There are some other nice examples, and we're going to use uh, an example programming in Odin that looks like this, super simple. It's a package with an identity function. It's polymorphic, so we can take any value and return that value. Uh, we have two other definitions. It's calling the identity function with tr three and uh, the string hello, so super easy. And the transformations we do is first we resolve imports. We don't have any imports in this program, so it's not super exciting here, but I just want to point out this property. We have, here we have the same uh, untyped package type, but it's parameterized by some list. Uh, and the source data has import references and the output data has imp imported packages. So. You can easily see in the type that this is what's going on. It's doing some kind of imports uh, resolution thing. The next step is the type inference. Here we see we take a, an untyped package of those uh, imported packages and we return this either value. And either is either an error or some result, some success. So we get a type error if we haven't, uh, if, we, if it doesn't type check, and we get a, a full package uh, as a result if it, everything goes well. So there's a command in the Odin uh, command line program called print inferred, and you can use that on a file and you could get back like the source code, but with type annotations for each definition. So here we see, okay, the, the compiler inferred identity, ha identity to have this type signature and free and so on. The next step is something called monomorphization. This takes uh, a package and returns a monomorph package. So this doesn't say much uh, just looking at it here, but if we look at, uh, at the monomorph uh, function for expressions, it's more clear what it does. It takes this expression data type that's parameterized by polymorphic type and it converts it to this uh, expression of a monomorphic type. So a polymorphic type is uh, where you have those type variables. You can call it with a string or an int and it, it works either way. A monomorphic type, you have to resolve all those cases and remove the, the type variables. So Go doesn't have generics. So to be able to compile polymorphic code to Go, you have to make it monomorphic if you don't want to use that kind of empty interface uh, object hack. But that's what we do here. We take, um, if we have an, a polymorphic function, we register all the, the calls to that and those specific types, and then we create instances of that function with those types that it was called with. 
So we get monomorphic instances of polymorphic functions. And this we can see if we use this print compiled command instead. So this is the same program. We have the free and hello as before, but these names look a little funny. So it's not, not just identity anymore. It's instances of identity with the specific types that it was called with. And here you see those instances. So these are the generated uh, code. And the original identity is gone because that was polymorphic and we can't use it. So it just isn't there. And the last step is code generation. It takes those monomorph packages and uh, either has an error or it uh, prints a lot of files, basically. So we can look at that as well. So here's the final Go output. There's a little prelude part. So if we ignore it, this is basically the, the thing that we care about. This looks like the monomorphed thing. OK. And to finish off, I just want to give some pointers to libraries and tools that I've used. So uh, for the parser thing in Odin, I've used uh, a library called Parsec. It's included in the standard Haskell libraries. Uh, I think it's a good start. It's easy to make up, to create your, your parser and easy to see the, how the syntax works. And there's more powerful tools if you want more control and I'm considering rewriting the parser later on in something else. But I don't regret using Parsec to start with. And then there's MTL, or the Monad Transformer Library. This I've used extensively in basically all modules that does something uh, at least tiny complicated. So uh, Monad Transformers is a, is a big chapter on its own. I don't. I won't go into it right now, but it's used a lot. And there's this uh, pretty print WLP print package I used to print types and source code and so on. Uh, I've used these HDEV tools or GHC mod, uh, which you can use with uh, basically any editor like Vim, Max, Sublime, and so on. This gives you uh, kind of fast, reasonably fast uh, error messages in your editor where you can get type annotations and look up types of expressions and so on. So they're good. And uh, I try to enable all the warnings and get, I use this hlint package, uh, it's, or this tool, it's really good. It basically says you can take all this complicated code and just write this instead because it works the same way. Because as Haskell is, is pure, it can do these kind of tricks. And I use uh, hspec with uh, some, uh, with this node daemon or guard thing to just have tests that run uh, on file changes. And to, uh, to wrap up this session, uh, we've talked about Odin, the functional programming language for the Go ecosystem. And uh, we talked about uh, where it's at right now and what's next and so on. And uh, Racket, Minicanron, and why I chose to rewrite the compiler in Haskell. Uh, we talked about explicit modeling and transformations in Haskell, what I think is uh, what you can gain from using Haskell and modeling in a specific way. And then we looked at these libraries and tools. And I want to... Uh, just inform you about uh, upcoming session uh, in a couple of weeks about monads and Haskell and stuff uh, here at Foo Cafe. If you'd like to contribute to Odin in any way, you can just try it out at the playground or download the compiler and uh, try it out. Or you can go discuss stuff, uh, features you'd like or things that should be changed or introduced or whatever. There's a mailing list, there's some IRC channel. You can go to GitHub, the GitHub repo. It's uh, odin-lang slash odin on GitHub. And send pull requests and yeah, you know the drill. So that's 
uh, all I have. Thank you for listening.